astronomy can be a fascinating field of science, but it can also easily seem fanciful, remote, or even irrelevant when faced with the many challenges of day-to-day -day life here on Earth. It's quite common for my colleagues and I to be asked why we study astronomy, why our research on the universe is important, or more pragmatically, why it's worth paying for. Depending on who you ask, answers might range from the importance of scientific education and literacy, to the inspirational power of space, or even the unexpected practical applications that might one day grow out of pure research. It's clear that communicating the discoveries, importance, and wonder of astronomy to the rest of the world is a crucial job for many of us. When asked to think of an expert science communicator, someone who excels at sharing the wonders of the cosmos and the beauty of billions of stars with an everyday audience, Carl Sagan's name often comes to mind. From the Cosmos TV series to his award-winning books and other writings, Sagan is often seen as a leading figure in the world of science communication. But he wasn't the first or the only messenger for sharing the excitement of space with the world. In this lesson, we'll explore the many things that have collectively sparked our enthusiasm for astronomy and why these are such a crucial part of the research we do. When did you first become interested in space? It no doubt happened before you sat down to watch this lesson. Maybe you learned about space in school, or read about it in a book, or watched an educational program on television. Maybe you read comic books filled with spaceships and aliens, or devoured science fiction novels, or watched episode after episode of Star Trek. Maybe you simply noticed one night that the sky looked beautiful, or saw a story on the news about adventurous astronauts or some incredible new scientific discovery. Whichever path you took, something likely captured your imagination and made you curious enough about space to want to learn more. Selling space can sometimes seem like an easy task. Simply showing people the wonders of the universe can be enough to ignite their interest. While some may be lucky enough to live under dark skies and be introduced to astronomy through backyard stargazing, others may need a different view in order to see the stars. The sight of the night sky is also only the first step. Questions ranging from what star is that to how do the stars actually work mean that a new astronomy enthusiast will want to hear from an expert. The first venues for sharing expert knowledge of astronomy were museums, and in particular, planetariums. Depictions of the night sky date back to indigenous art, but the first record of a moving depiction of the night sky comes from the year 1229, when Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II stole a tent built by Arab craftsmen during the Crusades. The tent could be spun, and tiny holes poked in its canopy would simulate the night sky to a viewer sitting inside during the day, producing what may have been the first planetarium show. Intricate mechanical models of the constellations and solar system would continue to be built for hundreds of years with steadily improving accuracy. The first planetarium as we know them today was built in the early 1900s as part of the Deutsches Museum in Munich. The museum was imagined as a celebration of science and engineering, and today it's still one of the largest science and technology museums in the world. Its founder, Oscar von Miller, wanted to feature astronomy in the museum, but struggled to figure out how to simulate a night sky for the public. He eventually contacted the Carl Zeiss Optical Company to get their help in constructing a public-friendly astronomy show. Their engineers began by imagining a ceiling poked full of holes, just like the Arab planetarium tent from hundreds of years earlier. But the lighting involved for a large viewing area seemed impossible. Eventually, they shifted to the idea of using tiny light bulbs inside a large ball-shaped room. But powering hundreds of light bulbs and turning the ball and modeling both slow-moving stars and faster-moving planets began to become unmanageable. It was Walter Bowersfeld, 
a Zeiss engineer who would later become one of the company's directors, who got the idea to use the dome not as a light bulb housing, but as a screen, projecting images of stars and planets onto it from a central mechanism that would be much smaller and easier to control. The calculations and construction took years and was slowed by World War I. But in 1923, the spectacular new Zeiss Planetarium technology had its first debut at the company's factory in Jena, to great acclaim. Professional astronomers were among its first admirers. Ellis Stromgren, the director of the Royal Copenhagen Observatory, described it as a school, theater, and cinema in one. The success of the Deutsches Museum Planetarium sparked a resurgence of interest in astronomy and a flurry of building projects as new planetariums sprouted up all over the world. The Adler Planetarium in Chicago opened in 1930, followed by the Griffith Observatory Planetarium in Los Angeles and the Hayden Planetarium in New York City in 1935, all using Zeiss projector technology. By the late 1940s, there were more than 200 planetariums in the United States alone, and other companies were getting into the business of building star projectors. Today, some of the best and largest planetariums are shifting to digital projection and full dome video capabilities. Some of these projections can now be directly paired with enormous astronomical data sets. Things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that we discussed in our last lesson, or multi-wavelength data from telescopes like Hubble and Chandra. Video domes can show specially produced shows with cutting-edge special effects that can transport visitors to the surface of the sun, the edge of the universe, or the inside of a black hole. Many others still rely on the classic projection style first pioneered by Walter Bowersfeld pairing indoor views of the night sky with live narration provided by enthusiastic planetarium employees or volunteers. There are more than 1,000 planetariums in the United States, hosting more than 20 million annual visitors. For nearly a century, planetariums and the museums that host them have been invaluable tools for science communication and sharing the riches of the night sky with everyone. They can also make quite an impression. In the first few years after it opened, one of the many visitors to New York City's Hayden Planetarium was a young Carl Sagan. In the middle of the 20th century, a television program on space captured the national imagination combining cutting-edge special effects with a knack for imagination and storytelling, it inspired viewers young and old to ponder the mysteries of the universe. I'm talking, of course, about Star Trek. Star Trek premiered in 1966. It was the product of Gene Roddenberry's imagination, enthusiasm for space travel sparked by the space race, and a boatload of science fiction influences. For decades, many professional and amateur astronomers have credited fictional worlds or stories with first inspiring their interest in the stars. I grew up on E.T. and Star Wars and devoured books like Carl Sagan's Contact, science fiction that combined adventure and storytelling with the gloriously geeky details that I'd learned to love. Today, we refer to fanciful stories about adventures in space as science fiction. But stories of adventures in the night sky stretch back for centuries, if not millennia, and can be found in countless indigenous histories. Let's look at an example. One story of astronomy and exploration imagines a newly created universe, with its creator traveling across the land and filling it with new people and languages. This creator carried a bunch of languages with them, and every time they created a people, they gave them a language. When they got to the Western Ocean, they liked the land so much that they stayed there, filling it with people who spoke all sorts of languages. This made communicating difficult, and it quickly caused a problem because the creator made a small design mistake. They built the sky too low. It was convenient at the time, letting people travel in and out of the sky at will, but it also meant tall people were whacking their heads on it and it was forever getting in the way. 
The people needed a solution, but it was tough because they spoke so many different languages. Eventually, a huge gathering was called. Nearly everyone came, and they all managed to agree on a common word and signal that would let them lift the sky at the same time. They lifted again and again, and slowly lifted the sky to where it is today. The problem was that a few people missed the meeting. This included three hunters, one of them with his dog, chasing four elk through the forest. The elk went running up into the night sky, and the hunters followed them, not realizing that while they were up there, everyone else was lifting the sky until it was too high for them to make it back down. This meant that the four elk were stuck in the sky, and so were the three hunters. Even the dog got stuck in the sky, sitting by his hunter's side. The story tells us that they're still up there today. In fact, you've probably seen them. They make the constellation that we know as the Big Dipper. This is a story from the Snohomish people, whose traditional lands are just north of where I teach at the University of Washington in Seattle. It's a fictional story, but just like any other good space adventure, it imagines a time when people could freely travel into the heavens and makes listeners look at the stars for a little longer. Anyone hearing this Snohomish story would immediately recognize the Big Dipper afterward whenever they looked up. And most would probably make a particular effort to look for the hunter with his hard-to-spot dog. Today, a curious listener might investigate further and learn that they're named Mizar and Alcor, and that there are actually six stars contained in that apparent pair. Alcor is a binary star system, and Mizar is a quadruple system. Science fiction, as we traditionally think of it, has always held a deep fascination with space travel and faraway worlds. Jules Verne imagined a trip to the moon in one of his books. Orson Welles made an indelible impression on listeners with the radio broadcast describing an alien invasion. And authors from Edgar Rice Burroughs to Ray Bradbury to Andy Weir imagined the perils and adventures of a journey to Mars. Many of these science fiction authors simply used space as a setting. They may use a dangerous planet or hostile aliens as story elements, but the details of their books are less about the physics of stars and galaxies and more about the feelings, imaginings, and politics of the people they feature. Still, for countless audiences, especially younger audiences, these stories brought their imaginations into space and fed their curiosity about the wider universe. Star Trek was immensely influential in this arena. Today, astronomers who study the science of life on other worlds remember an episode from season one, where the Enterprise crew encounters silicon-based life forms. This was a pretty good fictional premise, rooted in the shared atomic properties of silicon and carbon the atoms that form the backbone of almost all biological molecules found on Earth. Star Trek also offered early and progressive role models. Lieutenant Uhura is a favorite of many scientists today who saw themselves in the brilliant black professional woman who worked as the crew's translator. A decade after Star Trek premiered, movies and television had decisively joined books as key mediums for science fiction. By the time Star Wars arrived on the scene in 1977, space was a common setting for stories. Star Wars added its groundbreaking special effects to the mix, making space come alive for people in a way it never had before. Still, these visually spectacular mediums were mainly being used to tell imagined stories. Space was a setting or a backdrop with educational content left to classrooms and textbooks, or to planetariums. All of that would change just three years after Star Wars was released with the debut of a new and innovative TV show, Cosmos. Carl Sagan was born in Brooklyn in 1934. Neither of his parents were scientists, but he nevertheless credited them both with fostering his senses of wonder and skepticism at an early age. The Hayden Planetarium fanned the flames of Sagan's early interest in astronomy. 
And science fiction authors from H.G. Wells to Robert Heinlein caught his imagination and strengthened his passion for storytelling. Still, despite his enthusiasm, it wasn't until high school that Sagan learned that astronomer was in fact a job and a profession that paid well. Once he learned that, he was able to set astronomy as his career goal. Many other space enthusiasts, including myself, have similar backgrounds. It's one thing to be caught up in the grandeur and excitement of the cosmos, but quite another to imagine devoting your life to it when faced with the realities of needing a steady paying job. Sagan earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the University of Chicago, studying under eminent planetary scientist Gerard Kuiper. His early career resembled that of many other young accomplished scientists. He was a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, and then a tenure track professor at Harvard. Sagan, however, was denied tenure at Harvard and criticized for an approach to science that some believed was too broad. As a planetary scientist, his work ranged from radio observations of Venus to work on the habitability of Jupiter and Saturn's moons. Sagan's work also necessitated studying biology, evolution, and climate science, an unusual approach at the time when researchers tended to choose and stick with a single specialty. Most astronomers at the time didn't venture far outside their own fields. Sagan moved from Harvard to Cornell in 1968, where he was encouraged to continue his multidisciplinary work and foster his growing interest in science communication and popular writing. In 1977, he published The Dragons of Eden, a book that explored the evolution of intelligence. The book, his debut popular science publication, won a Pulitzer Prize, and in the aftermath of this success, he was approached by PBS to write and star in a science television series designed for a general audience. Cosmos premiered in 1980 to both popular and critical acclaim. Sagan's skill for writing and his clear, direct speaking style connected well with audiences. The show also used the dazzling cinematic special effects that had delighted people in Star Wars to tell not a fictional story, but a real one. Sagan could wander through an illustration of space-time or simulate flying between planets and stars on an imagined spaceship. His journeys visually resembled the adventures of Star Trek or Star Wars, but now the story was our own universe and the science of how it worked. After the sensational success of Cosmos, Carl Sagan went on to become the most recognizable and well-known science communicator of all time. Even in the midst of his success, however, some colleagues still turned up their noses at Sagan, seeing him as a lesser scientist because he was speaking to the public instead of to his peers and working on TV shows instead of research papers. Still, his efforts made him a hero to young viewers who now saw astronomy and science as a world they could inhabit. He also made a crucial impact on older viewers who could now look at things like the Hubble Space Telescope and other taxpayer-funded endeavors and see through Sagan's eyes the value they offered. Sagan passed away in 1996 at the age of 62, but his legacy remains in the immense surge of science communication venues and professionals. Planetariums and museums continue to offer accessible introductions to the science of astronomy. Entire television channels now feature scientists that share their excitement with a wide audience, including a number of astronomers. Cosmos itself was rebooted in 2014, this time hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson, another New York-born astronomer who corresponded with Carl Sagan as a teen and eventually took up a post at the Hayden Planetarium as director. Today, popular science books regularly become bestsellers and span a vast array of topics. With the advent of social media, grassroots science outreach has popped up everywhere from YouTube to Twitter. Scientists record podcasts, teleconference with classrooms, and join video game streaming platforms for Q&As. 
It's never been easier to hear from professional scientists. Sometimes we even write and record lessons for the great courses. But why? Why should we treat science communication as a heroic endeavor in astronomy? Are Carl Sagan's detractors right? Should scientists stick to science? After all, filming a TV show or sharing research on Twitter takes up time that scientists could be spending on research. If we think of science as merely the cycle of making and testing hypotheses, this could be a fair argument. But science is more than that. It's also about sharing knowledge, and this makes science communication a fundamental part of scientific research. And for a field like astronomy, where the importance of our work might not be immediately clear, communicating what we do is vital. A society that funds research should be encouraged to hear about the results and to understand how these results fit into the larger world. Pure scientific research also always offers the possibility of unexpected scientific gains. Think of general relativity, a brilliant but not terribly practical theory when it was first described in 1915. And now, think about how the smartphone in your pocket or the navigation in your car crucially depends on Einstein's theories. I also like to think of astronomy as a gateway science. We may not regularly invent new technology or cure diseases, but the cosmos clearly captures people's imaginations in a way that few other things can. Someone may read about black holes and decide to study them, or they may ask questions about the computers that simulate black holes and become inspired to build a better computer. Or they may go into another field entirely, but still cherish the importance of scientific inquiry. An enthusiasm for the stars can easily turn into an enthusiasm for other realms of science, and the more we can encourage this, the better. Astronomers are often asked about the practical applications of our field. Some of our answers are admittedly pretty speculative. General relativity did great things for GPS, but we're still not quite clear on what gravitational waves could do for everyday technology here on Earth. That said, there is one pretty immediate and practical reason for citizens of our planet to want to keep an eye on space. Once in a while, space comes to us. In our next lesson, we'll begin exploring our immediate cosmic backyard and talk about some of our closest neighbors, who sometimes get a bit too close for comfort.